On October 9, 2014, Rico Harris left his mother's home in Alhambra, California to make the 17-hour, 1,000-mile journey to Seattle, Washington. Rico had recently moved in with his fiancée, Jennifer Song, and had made a last-minute trip home to visit family and gather items. At the time he begins the trip, Rico has been awake for nearly 30 hours, and both his fiancée and his mother express concern for his safety, urging him to rest and to take the trip in the morning. However, Rico has an important business meeting the next night and doesn't want to miss out on the opportunity to secure himself a permanent position with the company. Through text messages and phone calls, Rico communicates with his mother and his fiance throughout the night and early morning hours. Around 10 a.m., Jennifer Song receives the last known communication from Rico. After several hours without contact, panic sets in, and Rico's family grows concerned. Two days later, Rico's abandoned car is found in the lower site parking area of Cache Creek Regional Park in Yolo County, California. The car's battery is dead, the gas tank is empty, and the car appears to have been ransacked. The Sheriff's Department contacts police in Alhambra where the vehicle is registered, and Rico's mother is visited by the police, notifying her that they have found her son's car. At this point, Rico's mother files a missing persons report. Initially, the only trace of Rico that can be found is a single shoe print, but later, when his cell phone is recovered. Odd videos shot by Rico add more confusion to an already perplexing disappearance. Several witnesses report sightings of Rico, but search efforts involving ATVs and police dogs turn up no new leads. Law enforcement and Rico's family take opposite sides in their theories of where Rico could be and what could have happened to him. Did Rico choose to walk off into the forest of his own will? Was he losing a long battle with substance abuse that led him astray? Or did Rico come into contact with someone dangerous? Welcome to the Trace Evidence Podcast, Episode 4, The Mystery of Rico Harris. Welcome to the Trace Evidence Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today's episode focuses on the utterly strange disappearance of Rico Harris. Before getting into the details, just a couple of bits of information I wanted to go over. First, if I sound slightly different on this episode, it's because I changed microphones in the hopes of getting a better, more consistent quality to the audio. In addition to that, I've also launched a website for Trace Evidence, which you can find at trace-evidence.com. That's T-R-A-C-E dash E-V-I-D-E-N-C-E dot com. There you can find all of the links to subscribe on platforms such as iTunes and Stitcher. In addition, there's links to the Facebook group if you're interested in joining. It's kept private so that you can post without your thoughts and comments showing up in the news feeds of your friends. Your request to join will be approved as soon as possible. In addition to posting the audio files for the podcast on the site, I've made a section of episode transcripts to make the podcast more available to the hearing impaired or for those of you who simply want to read them. In the future, I'll be adding sections which show images and provide links to further case evidence that I focused my research on. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter at TraceEvPod. That's T-R-A-C-E-E-V-P-O-D. Send tweets with your questions, comments, or case suggestions. Or you can email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. I've been seeing new listeners coming in due to iTunes suggestions. So if you enjoy the show, please give us a rate and review. Every good review helps bring new ears to the podcast and more attention to these cases. Lately, I've had some great interactions with you guys on the Facebook group. I really enjoy talking about these cases with you and hearing your theories and opinions. Remember, if there are cases you'd like me to cover, don't hesitate to let me know. I'll gladly take a look and see about doing an episode on it. And if I do the episode, I'll credit you in that episode with suggesting the case. The disappearance of Rico Harris is a case I've heard about and even looked into a little bit in the past. But upon researching it for this episode, I was able to find information that I hadn't read before. A lot of times, in missing persons cases, there's a whole lot of information available, but bringing it all together can illuminate theories and help navigate the confusion, 
and this certainly is a case wrought in confusion. This is the haunting disappearance of Rico Harris. At the time of his disappearance, Rico Harris stood six foot nine and weighed in around 300 pounds. The former basketball player and NBA hopeful wore a size 18 shoe, and suffice it to say, he stood out in a crowd. This makes his vanishing even more startling, being that even strangers who had never seen him before couldn't help but take a glance at the large figure moving beside them. This is the kind of guy that when he walked through an airport, people noticed him. Rico had a back and forth relationship with basketball. Although he loved the sport, he had walked away from it in his past for one reason or another. When he finally made the decision to devote himself to the court, he was almost unstoppable. Though he hadn't been the best student, struggling to make his grades, he managed, through the help of his friends, to buckle down and pull his high school GPA up to a 3.0. UCLA would eventually offer him a scholarship, but due to poor SAT results, the scholarship would be rescinded. After high school, Rico attended Arizona State University, but was under academic probation, which required him to raise his grades in order to attain the eligibility to play. In 1996, Harris, along with other members of the basketball team, was charged with unlawful imprisonment, but the charges were later dropped when investigators found inconsistencies in the alleged victim's stories. However, as a result, Arizona State required Harris to sit out another season. Rather than wait, Rico withdrew from ASU and returned home to California, enrolling at Los Angeles City College, where he returned to basketball and drew comparisons to NBA player Lamar Odom. Rico led the team to their first ever state title and was named MVP for the season. At this point, Rico signed a letter of intent to attend college in Rhode Island and play there, but he stopped attending a psychology class he needed to pass to maintain his eligibility. Some speculated at the time that Rico had purposefully done so in order to avoid having to move across the country and be away from his family and friends. Rico returned to Los Angeles City College, something he would later say that he regretted, but he began partying heavily. His drinking increased and friends and teammates noticed, but Rico's game didn't suffer. He continued to put up points and to lead the team to victory. However, as the season wore on, Rico would receive a six-game suspension and his coach labeled him as a disruption to the team. Rico's drinking continued to get worse, and while several colleges attempted to recruit him, Rico turned down their offers, believing they were only interested in his play and not in his academics. Instead, Rico put himself into the NBA draft. He was invited to attend a pre-draft camp in Chicago, but he failed to respond and withdrew himself from the draft shortly thereafter. Rico then attended Cal State Northridge, playing basketball there, but he was no longer the Rico Harris of old. His points per game began to fall off, and while Rico still had great potential, some of the fire that had caught the attention of NBA scouts previously had been burned away. As a result of his poor play, NBA scouts began showing less and less interest. Early in the season, Rico was suspended by his coach for arguing with his teammates and other coaches. Towards the end of the season, Rico was suspended again. This time, Rico never returned to discuss coming off suspension, and Rico Harris, the former NBA hopeful and giant of college basketball, never played for a college team again. Rico decided instead to play semi-professional basketball since his eligibility to play with any college team was now gone. After bouncing through a couple of semi-pro outfits, he was offered a spot on the Harlem Globetrotters. Unfortunately, just a month after joining the team, Rico was involved in an altercation and was struck on the back of the head with a baseball bat. The head injury caused lingering issues, which resulted in Rico leaving the Harlem Globetrotters and his basketball career behind him. At this point, Rico's life began a downward spiral. And now without a college to attend, a team to play for, or a job to pay the bills, he moved into his mother's home in Alhambra, California. Rico began to drink even more heavily, and soon found himself indulging in heroin, meth, and crack. During the 2000s, Rico racked up over 100 arrests, and most of these were for public intoxication. 
According to friends and family, Rico would spend a few days in jail, sober up, and then go right back to drinking. He would panhandle and beg on the street to support his habit. When Rico turned 30, he overdosed on pain medication, and this seemed to jolt him out of his stupor. He entered rehab. The program was hard, and Rico spent a long time pursuing the goal of becoming sober, and eventually, he successfully completed his time in rehab. Now clean and sober for the first time in years, Rico moved in with the friend he made at rehab and got himself a job working security. It was here that Rico would meet Jennifer Song, with whom he would begin a friendship that would eventually become a romantic relationship. Jennifer lived in Seattle, Washington, but despite the distance, the two were more interested in what they had between each other instead of the distance. In 2012, they began traveling back and forth, taking long weekends to stay with each other. Two years later, their relationship was going strong. In 2014, Rico and Jennifer began to discuss the possibility of marriage. Rico's then roommate, Wilfredo Mayorga, argued with Rico about his relationship with Jennifer, among other things. Rico suddenly made the decision to move in with Jennifer, moving out of the shared apartment and leaving Mayorga to deal with their shared bills. Shortly after moving in with Jennifer, Rico began to take steps to solidify Seattle as his new home. Rico exchanged his California license for a Washington state license and began hunting for jobs. Reportedly, there was some friction between he and Jennifer initially. Rico missed his family and the familiarity of California. Rico didn't feel at home in Washington, and he couldn't find work. Jennifer has said that the change was difficult for Rico, but that he tried to keep his hopes up. Soon, Rico's hopes would turn positive as he found a part-time job selling timeshares. Things were beginning to turn around for Rico, and soon thereafter, Rico's employer wanted to discuss the possibility of promoting him to a full-time position as a property appraiser. According to Jennifer, Rico was excited and hopeful for the future. The early pangs of sadness and depression which had struck him upon moving to Seattle seemed to have been in his past, and everything was falling into place. Rico had managed to take a difficult, troubled past and was now transforming it into a bright future. He made arrangements with his employer to discuss the job on the evening of October 10th. For unknown reasons, prior to this meeting, on October 8th, Rico decided that he needed to return home to Alhambra and see his family. There is some speculation as to what the reason was for this trip, with there being some who have stated that Rico was having issues with Jennifer and that he was looking to get away for a short time. Others, however, have said that Rico was upbeat and happy and simply wanted to visit his family. Jennifer has said that she believed Rico wanted to see his family, to find closure for his mistakes, and to assure his family that he was on the straight and narrow, and that he was excited to be getting married and starting a new life. Rico began the thousand mile drive from his shared residence with Jennifer to his mother's home in Alhambra. According to Rico's friend, David Lara, he spoke with Rico on the phone during the trip, and Rico seemed to be in good spirits and was happy with the direction his life was heading. Regardless of Rico's reasons for the visit home, he didn't stick around very long. According to his family, Rico arrived in Alhambra on October 9th. He took one of his brothers out to dinner and gave him the gift of a new cell phone. Following dinner, Rico returned to his mother's home where the two sat down to have a private conversation. Rico's mother has stated that she believes Rico was looking for something or trying to get something from their conversation. She wasn't quite sure what it was, but she does feel like Rico didn't find the answer or the information he was seeking. Shortly after midnight, Rico packed some of his personal belongings into his car. Rico's mother found it odd that he had traveled all the way back home just to get a few random items and believed he returned home for other reasons and possibly just because he missed them. At this point, Rico's mother says that she told him to come inside and take a nap and to leave for Seattle in the morning. She laid down on the couch waiting for him and fell asleep. The next time she heard from Rico was at 1 a.m., when he called her and said he was on his way back to Seattle, taking Interstate 5 North. This is a pretty rapid turnaround and a long trip to make twice in two days. According to his family, Rico hadn't slept more than a few hours since he'd left Seattle the day before. Rico had left Seattle, driven over a thousand miles, had dinner, talked with his mother, and then hit the road again to begin another thousand miles back. Rico said he needed to go back that day because of the meeting that he had with his employer and he didn't want to miss it. According to Rico's fiance, 
Rico had been awake for nearly 30 hours when he left Seattle and nearly 40 when he left his mother's house. According to the police, Rico stopped in Lodi, California, 40 miles south of Sacramento, to get gas. Later that morning, at 3.30 a.m., he placed a call to Jennifer, telling her that he was feeling tired and that he was planning to stop in the mountains and rest. Jennifer reportedly told him that he should find a rest area to park in and to get some sleep for a few hours. She encouraged Rico to stop before getting to the mountains, knowing that he has been awake for nearly 40 hours and that mountain roads are curvy and dangerous, especially at night. Jennifer placed a call to Rico at 8 a.m., and he answers, informing her that he's eating and stopping for gas. According to Jennifer, Rico sounds exhausted and worn out. After getting off the phone with Jennifer, Rico places a call to his mother to check in and let her know where he is and that he's doing all right. Approximately two hours after Jennifer last spoke with Rico, she received a text message from him which read, quote, I'm doing well, I love you, end quote. This is the last known communication from Rico and was received around 10.45 a.m. As the hours pass and neither Jennifer nor Rico's mother hear from him, both begin to get worried. Jennifer calls Rico multiple times, but the phone goes unanswered. Jennifer notes that this is not like Rico. He always answers the phone, if he can, and if he doesn't, he's quick to call back, but the call never comes. Jennifer thought it was possible that Rico was passing through a stretch of highway where he didn't have reception, and it isn't until eight hours later, at 7 p.m., that her concern can no longer be contained. Jennifer calls Rico's mother and discovers that she hasn't heard from him either. Jennifer suggests filing a missing persons report, but claims that Rico's mother tells her that you can't file a missing persons report unless the person has been gone for at least 48 hours. Just for the record, it's often said on television shows and has been purported by the media that you have to wait 48 hours before filing a missing persons report. However, this is a myth developed from fiction. The police do not have a specific waiting period which must be adhered to. If you know someone is missing, report it immediately. The 48 hours lost can make a large difference between finding and not finding someone. Police urge these reports to be filed as quickly as possible. When several days pass and no one has heard from Rico, Jennifer and Rico's mother decide to file a missing persons report. Police begin investigating, but since Rico is an adult and on a road trip, they aren't immediately overly concerned. They put out notifications on his vehicle and his description, but no overarching search is issued for him. Everyone involved assumes that Rico is either visiting somewhere or his phone has died, but both Jennifer and Rico's mother believe they will hear from him soon. On a previous trip, Rico had disappeared for a short period of time, having stopped in San Diego for a few hours before continuing on his journey. It isn't unlike Rico to change his plans without notifying Jennifer. According to Jennifer, Rico's mother, and Rico's friend David, Rico had a tendency to wander. He often went off alone and cut himself off from others to clear his head or just to unwind. However, this usually was only for a few hours, not a few days. As hours slowly turned into days, and Rico doesn't make contact with anyone, Jennifer and Rico's mother become gravely concerned. On October 14th, Yolo County Sheriff's Deputy Danny Del Castillo is cruising down Route 16. He pulls into the lower site, a parking area a ways back from the road. He is on routine patrol, checking the area and nearby campgrounds for anything out of the ordinary. Del Castillo makes note of a black Nissan Maxima parked near the bushes. The vehicle is not in a parking space, instead parked off to the side. Del Castillo realizes something is amiss as he recalls spotting the same vehicle in the same location the previous day. Del Castillo parks his cruiser and approaches the vehicle. The vehicle is locked, but he can see the interior is in disarray. Through the window, Del Castillo can see papers, CDs, and credit cards thrown all about the interior as if someone had ransacked the vehicle looking for something. However, the fact that there are items of value, including credit cards, in plain sight doesn't immediately trigger alarms in his mind. He runs the plate regardless. Del Castillo finds the vehicle hasn't been reported stolen, and there were no outstanding tickets or warrants. Del Castillo radios in and speaks to the sheriff, who advises him that they will contact the local authorities where the vehicle is registered, Alhambra, California. Shortly after receiving word from the Yolo County Sheriff's Department, two officers from the Alhambra Police Department knocked on Rico's mother's door 
and informed her that Rico's abandoned vehicle had been found and that Rico was nowhere to be seen. The Yolo County Sheriff's Department began a search and rescue operation in search of Rico in the nearby hills and mountains. Search dogs and helicopters were called in, along with all-terrain vehicles and a plane utilizing thermographic cameras. The search team focused first on the five-mile radius around the parking lot, but eventually, 27 miles of Route 16 were covered, checking over each inch of the surrounding canyon. No sign of Rico was located at first. Search teams were baffled. Rico stood six foot nine and weighed around 300 pounds. Searchers couldn't wrap their head around how someone of his size could go without being noticed. Not to mention, Rico was now 37 years old and not in the same shape he had been in when he played basketball. This was rough terrain for an experienced hiker, let alone for someone of Rico's size, without any supplies or familiarity with the area. The area being searched was populated with mountain lions and bears and has been described as very rough terrain with cliffs and hard to pass rock. During the search, police managed to locate a single footprint from an athletic shoe. The footprint appears to be the size Rico would have worn. However, this is the only clue found from the initial search. Three days pass, and no new evidence or sightings are reported. Rico's description is reported to the local press. Flyers are printed up, and the Yolo County Sheriff's Department notifies other local police agencies of his status as a missing person. A traveler later called the Sheriff's Department and stated that he had seen Rico sitting on a guardrail overlooking the creek which ran adjacent to the parking lot the day he vanished. The Yolo County Sheriff's Department towed Rico's vehicle and began a forensic inspection. According to their results, the battery was nearly dead and the black Nissan Maxima was completely out of gas. Rico's wallet is found and after checking it over, all of his credit cards are located except for a Discover card registered in his name. To this date, no charges have ever been made on the Discover card since the day Rico vanished. Rico's California driver's license is also in the vehicle. Rico's phone is missing from the vehicle and it's believed he has taken it with him. It is tentatively theorized that Rico, having run out of gas, has vanished while in the process of seeking out a service station or someone to give him a ride. Did he perhaps get into the wrong vehicle, or fall victim to a hit and run, or something worse? The police also find two plastic bottles in Rico's car. One was nearly full to the brim with liquor. The other bottle is empty, but smells of the same liquor. In addition to the alcohol, investigators find a bindle in Rico's car. A bindle is a piece of Ziploc bag or plastic baggie, usually cut into a small piece and wrapped in a rubber band. It is frequently associated with drugs such as cocaine or meth. Forensic testing finds no traces of illegal substances on the bindle. On October 18th, eight days after Rico disappeared, a new witness calls in with a sighting of Rico. According to the witness, he had driven past the parking lot where Rico's car had been found and saw a large man wearing light-colored pants, much like what Rico had last been seen wearing. Police once more looked over the area and discovered a new size 18 shoe print consistent with Rico's known shoe, leading from the parking lot and heading down towards the creek. In addition to this new shoe print, a large pair of shoe insoles are found not far from the footprint. Had Rico returned to this spot, hoping to get back into his car, but noticing it missing, since it had been impounded by the sheriff's department, decided to hitch a ride or wander off into the woods or the creek? Search dogs were called in, and although they could not pinpoint anything for sure, the dogs led investigators down through the parking lot and to the creek. Yolo County Sheriff's Department Detective Dean Nyland received Rico's case and immediately places a phone call to AT&T, using cell phone pings to map out Rico's travels in the day leading up to his disappearance. Once arriving in the area where his vehicle was located, Rico's phone loses reception and can't be tracked. According to the cell phone pings, Rico had stopped in Lodi, California, 40 miles south of Sacramento, to fill up his gas tank. After making an apparent wrong turn, Rico corrected his direction and passed through Sacramento, turning onto Route 16 and into the Capay Hills, where he would later pull into the Lower Sight parking lot. Detective Nyland is confused by this for several reasons. Rico filled his gas tank, and given the distance between the filling station and the Lower Sight parking lot, Rico should have had around 13 gallons of gas left in his tank, yet it's empty when they find it. In addition to the discrepancy in gas supply, 
The lower site parking lot is 50 miles west of Interstate 5, the road leading to Seattle. Essentially, to have arrived in the lower site parking lot, Rico would have had to have driven 50 miles off his charted course, and if he was simply looking for a place to pull over and rest, this doesn't make a great deal of sense. Police find a ping on Rico's cell phone that shows it's in the location of the Redwood Valley area, 75 miles northwest from the location of his car. Police begin searching and place calls to residents of Redwood Valley, eventually finding a man who's in possession of Rico's phone. According to the man, he was with his wife and grandson, driving near the lower site when they saw a black backpack on the side of the road, but no one else around. They pulled over and began calling out, looking for the owner, but received no answer. When they didn't get an answer, they decided to take the backpack with them on their trip home. The location of the backpack was reportedly 1,500 feet away from the guardrail where an earlier witness had reported seeing Rico sitting. In the backpack, police found Rico's phone, phone charger, jumper cables, and what they referred to as non-consequential items. The backpack was not damaged in any way, and neither was the phone. All were in good shape, and apparently had been simply left behind. Upon inspection of Rico's phone, police find several photos and videos. There are photos of the nearby creek, and a selfie of Rico striking a pose in front of a sign welcoming drivers to Yolo County. The videos appear to have been taken by Rico accidentally, and show odd behavior. In the videos, Rico can be seen singing, rapping, and laughing. However, the videos also show Rico throwing CDs inside of his car, playing with his rearview mirror, and ripping up papers and throwing them around as well. Timestamps on the video show them as having been made during the night of October 10th, meaning that Rico had in fact been alive and in his vehicle hours after his last communication. An odd detail of the contents of the backpack were the jumper cables. Jennifer claims they're Rico's and that he always kept them in the trunk, so why were they in his backpack instead? If Rico had been out looking for someone to jump his vehicle, remember the battery was nearly dead. Why wouldn't he simply leave the cables behind and use them if he found someone to come help him? Rico's mother believes that finding the backpack is a good sign that Rico's still in the area. Jennifer, however, has the opposite feeling, stating that Rico never went without his backpack and that he carried it around like a purse and that if he left it behind, something is very wrong. At this point, another set of witnesses call in, stating that they had seen Rico in the parking lot near his vehicle and that he had looked lost and confused at the day that he vanished. On October 22nd, 12 days after Rico was last seen, the Sheriff's Department began scaling back their search efforts. The next month, in November, a team of divers were called in to search the creek and some sinkholes within it that cadaver dogs had led them to. One cadaver dog is reported to have indicated towards one of the sinkholes in the creek, but nothing is found. Detective Nyland, who had initially run the pings on Rico's phone, begins digging deeper into the case. He starts with Rico's fiancée, Jennifer, wanting to know why, if she was so worried, she didn't file a missing persons report earlier. Jennifer explains that both she and Rico's mother had thought it best to wait, as Rico had gone off course in the past. However, at some point, Jennifer explains that Rico may have been having substance abuse issues again. According to Jennifer, she had visited Rico prior to his move up to Seattle, and he didn't seem like himself. His bedroom was a mess, and he was distant and withdrawn. Allegedly, Rico told her that he had slipped up and broken his six years of sobriety. Nyland feels suspicious and considers it odd that it took so long to file the missing persons report. Nyland begins searching through homeless shelters and areas where transients often gather. Nyland is frustrated, noting that this is a large man who is hard to miss, but who also has to get hungry. How is it possible that no one has spotted him walking along the road or eating at a local restaurant? His complete and total disappearance is absolutely baffling to him. The nearest gas station to the lower site parking area is 30 miles away, and unless Rico was given a ride, more people would have seen him along the way. However, he does have a theory. Nyland believes that Rico purchased and used meth sometime right before or after parking his car. Nyland believes Rico was likely on meth when he left his mother's home and links the meth to the reason Rico had been awake for such a long period of time. A reporter would later write a story that he had spoken to an unnamed source who reported that he had seen Rico and that a friend of his had delivered meth to Rico in the Lower Side parking lot, 
and that Rico had began walking towards the creek. However, this can't be confirmed. Nyland looks into Rico's bank account, which he shares with Jennifer, but sees no activity that could be linked to Rico. Both Rico's family and Jennifer question whether or not it's possible that Rico could have had another bank account that they didn't know about, but police find no evidence of this. Nyland theorizes that Rico's vanishing is not linked to foul play and suspects that Rico has chosen to go off the grid. Nyland cites that there are no signs of a struggle and that his backpack and phone were both in perfect condition and appear to have been purposefully left behind. Nyland believes that Rico chose to leave them behind because he didn't want to be electronically tracked. According to Nyland, he believes Rico had doubts about his future and his move to Seattle and that Rico chose instead to go his own way. When asked about the videos on Rico's phone, Nyland states that Rico seemed like, quote, a free man. Nyland believes that Rico chose to hike in the area to clear his head, to think things over, to attempt to overcome his resurfacing substance abuse struggles, or perhaps be consumed by them. According to Nyland, quote, we have no sightings, so he probably got a ride, end quote. Rico's family feel as though the investigators wrote Rico off based on his previous struggles with drugs and alcohol, and the evidence that he may have been relapsing. Rico's mother feels that the police found out about his history and made the decision that Rico was just another druggie and not worth the effort. Detective Nylon, however, states that he has investigated every report and every piece of evidence brought before him. According to Nylon, he still checks Rico's financial information looking for signs of Rico or perhaps identity theft that could lead to someone with more information. Nyland is baffled by the case and can't wrap his head around what could have happened, other than Rico choosing to wander off. Nyland does, however, believe that Rico ended up at the lower site parking lot not due to a desire to rest, but to find a quiet, secluded spot in which to do drugs. In the nearly three years since Rico's disappearance, there have been no additional sightings reported. Rico has had no contact with his family, nor with his fiancée, Jennifer. Detective Nyland's theory is simply one of several possibilities. One theory floating around is that Rico, succumbing to his previous addictions and with the evidence of liquor in his vehicle, parked his car in the lower sight parking lot and began drinking heavily. Being that he had been away from liquor for years, he may have jumped in with both feet and drank himself into a blackout and in his drunken stupor, wandered off into the surrounding forest and gotten lost. By the time he sobered up, he'd have no knowledge of where he was or which direction to go. Even if he wanted to get back to his vehicle, he'd be lost in a heavily wooded, hilly area. Some people suspect that Rico simply didn't want to move to Seattle, but also didn't want to return to his past in Alhambra, and as a result, chose to leave his life behind and begin a new one. Although this is always possible, it seems unlikely. Rico has a history of not wanting to be far from his home and his family, and so if anything, it would seem more probable that he would simply have gone home rather than to have wandered off into an area in which he had no familiarity, friends, connections, or prospects. There were likely drugs, and certainly alcohol, involved in Rico's disappearance. Is it possible that Rico made an attempt to purchase drugs and got into the car with someone he shouldn't have and things went wrong? Absolutely. But without a shred of evidence, all theories are possible and impossible to prove. So how does a 6 foot 9, 300 pound man simply vanish? The disappearance of Rico Harris is a baffling, frustrated case of dead ends. All we have to go on are the random pings of a cell phone, lighthearted selfies and perplexing videos that show the last known moments of a man who may have been becoming unwound. So did Rico choose to walk away? Was he pulled away? Or are there others involved who know exactly what happened to Rico Harris? Rico Harris's disappearance is a confounding event. In a lot of missing persons cases, there are no items of evidentiary value. A person vanishes, and there isn't a trace of them to be found. No sightings, no personal items, nothing. On the contrary, in the case of Rico Harris, there's quite a bit of evidence found by investigators. However, clues and pieces of evidence can sometimes only make a disappearance more confusing, and that certainly appears to be the case when it comes to Rico Harris. It has been established that Rico had a troubled past. Issues with drugs and alcohol, a failure of conviction in terms of his plans to be a basketball player. However, does that make him irredeemable? I don't think so. Rico made mistakes, and there's no denying that. 
but he also worked hard to correct his course in life. I can't really comment on what his mindset was, but I can relate to some of the choices he made. I never found myself heavily involved with drugs or alcohol, but I've known many people who have gone down that road. There was a lot of speculation that Rico's choice in regard to basketball had less to do with his desire to play and more to do with his desire to stay close to his family. I can understand that. I'd be lying if I said I never made a choice based on how far it was going to take me away from the people I care about. Some people were born to wander, and others hold tight to their familial connections. Rico was raised without a father, and although he knew who his father was, according to his mother, Rico's father faced many of the same substance abuse problems that Rico did, but he wasn't nearly as successful at overcoming them. This left a vacancy in Rico's life, and established a firm connection with his mother, who successfully raised him and his siblings on her own. There's a story about Rico later in life, when he was in the midst of his battle with drugs and alcohol, where he was arrested for public intoxication, and he got thrown in the drunk tank for the night. According to Rico's mother, Rico's father was in that same cell with him that night, but was so drunk and out of it, he didn't even recognize his own son. Obviously, Rico had a lot of demons to deal with, and unfortunately for him, it took him a long time to overcome them, but he did, and for six years Rico managed to stay clean and sober. During those six years, he worked on building a new life, and in the course of building that life, Rico met and fell in love with Jennifer Song. It was his relationship with Jennifer that drove him forward, and according to a close friend, Rico was full of hope and love, was looking forward to settling down and starting a family. According to Rico's mother, a few months before he was supposed to move to Seattle, she became suspicious that he was drinking again. Jennifer states that she flew down to visit Rico and realized something was off. His room, which he normally kept clean, was a mess. The flowers he usually gave her when she visited were absent, and he seemed distant. According to Jennifer, when she confronted him about the changes, he admitted that he had fallen off the wagon. Jennifer never specifies in what way, but it sounds as though he was definitely drinking again. Whether or not he was using other substances, we can't know for sure. Alcoholism is a strong disease. And if you speak to any recovering alcoholic, they'll tell you that it's an everyday battle. That's why they say, one day at a time. It's not uncommon to fall off the wagon a time or two before kicking the habit for good. Rico, like many, used alcohol and drugs as a coping mechanism for the stresses in his life. Based on past experiences with his basketball career, Rico had concerns about being too far away from home. So it's entirely possible that the move to Seattle was weighing heavy on his mind. Jennifer has said that when Rico first moved into Seattle, he seemed depressed and didn't unpack his boxes for a few weeks. However, once he found a job and began exploring the city, he began to feel more at home. So what leads to his utterly strange disappearance? There are a few theories which have been developed over the years since Rico's disappearance. The first theory is that Rico met with foul play. Having driven up from the lower site parking area to rest, Rico could have been approached by a stranger and been drawn out of his vehicle under the guise of assisting someone. Rico was commonly referred to as a giant teddy bear by his friends and family, saying that despite his size, he was a gentle giant. If this is the case, and Rico was the shirt off his back type of guy, he could have been talked into going off with someone who didn't have the best of intentions. It's also possible that Rico could have been purchasing drugs as the police suspect, and that that person didn't have the best of intentions either. I honestly don't think this theory carries a lot of weight, though. Considering Rico's backpack being found on the side of the road, his footprints and insoles being found by the creek, and the sightings from passers-by who saw him the next day when it was light out, although Rico's family strongly feels that someone knows what happened to him, I honestly don't think this is a situation of a stranger abduction, murder, or robbery gone wrong. The evidence just doesn't support this theory, and although it's always possible, I think it's the thinnest theory in relation to this disappearance. There are those who believe that Rico simply chose to walk away. This is a somewhat common theory in adult disappearances. When someone's over the legal age to make the choice to walk away if they want, you frequently hear people say that that person has that right. I hear this theory a lot in cases where there isn't a lot of evidence or there doesn't appear to be signs of foul play. In relation to Rico Harris, the theory has been put forth 
based on the fact that Rico has reportedly had a tendency of going off on his own to think things over and to try and get his headspace where he wants it to be. Although this is entirely possible, Rico's history of taking time out for himself has a typical limit on it. Nowhere have I been able to locate a record of anyone saying Rico having gone off without telling anyone for more than a day or so. In addition to this, in these instances, Rico didn't leave important personal items behind, like his cell phone and his car. In interviews with Detective Nyland, he's even said that there's a high possibility that Rico chose to walk away. He's pointed out the lack of evidence of foul play and the lack of indication that anything forced Rico to leave his car and backpack behind. Although the evidence does lack any indications that would typically stand out and show a reason for his disappearance, this seems more like the result of there being no easy answers. It's an assumption to fall back to when all other clues lead nowhere. However, Nyland has also said that wherever Rico went, he likely didn't go alone. Nyland believes it's entirely possible that Rico caught a ride from someone. Being that the nearest gas station was 30 miles from his car, it's highly unlikely that he walked there without being sighted more along the way. Rico's not an easy figure to miss, and had he been wandering down the road for a long stretch of time, more people would have seen him. Since they didn't, that only leaves a few possibilities. Either more people saw him but didn't report the sightings, or Rico was picked up by someone, or Rico didn't walk away from the parking lot but instead walked into the countryside itself. One piece of evidence, which suggests to me that Rico may have been attempting to walk into town or to get a ride, is the fact that the car's jumper cables were found in his backpack. This has been pointed out as an odd thing. In interviews, I've seen comments from Detective Nyland, and even Rico's mother, about how Rico always kept his jumper cables in the trunk, and it was strange for them to be in his backpack. However, I've tried to look at this piece of evidence from every possible angle, and I think my own personal level of anxiety and my hyper-awareness of the untrustworthiness of people has led me to a possible reason. Rico was 6 foot 9 and nearly 300 pounds. By no means would he appear to be the gentle giant that people described him to be. He was likely aware of how people viewed him, and considering that he had previously worked security jobs, he was also aware that he cut an intimidating shape. I think it's highly possible that Rico took the jumper cables with him, so that if he managed to flag someone down for assistance, he could show the cables as an assurance that he was in fact having a problem with his car, and maybe lessen the fear someone might feel as he approached them. I obviously can't know this for sure. It's also possible that he brought them because, although there are good people out there, there are others who just don't want to help, and might say they couldn't help because they didn't have jumper cables, and he could show them that it wasn't a problem, because he did. Purely speculative, but this is the only reason I've been able to come up with as to why Rico would take the cables with him instead of leaving them in his car. I don't know what the traffic in and out of the parking area is like, but I can't help but wonder, if Rico had stayed near his car, would we have a missing person at all? Another theory revolves around the environment in which Rico found himself. Footprints and shoe and soles were found down by the creek. Some theorize that Rico wandered down to the creek to either look at the scenery or get a drink of water, and in the course of one of these actions, it's highly possible that Rico slipped and fell into the creek. From what I've seen of the creek, it's fairly wide and deep, including multiple sinkholes. We know about these because divers were sent into them to search for Rico. Although it's very possible, I have a problem with it, and that's, again, Rico's backpack. Why would he pack his bag, walk out of the parking site, head down the road, sit on the guardrails a witness spotted him, place his bag down on one side of the road where anyone could grab it when he isn't there, and remember that Jennifer stated that this bag was like his purse and went everywhere with him, just so that he could go down to the creek. It's a backpack, and all he'd have to do is throw one arm through the strap and bring it with him. Another problem with the creek possibility is that Rico was spotted a week after he was reported missing, seen in the area where his car had been parked before police towed it. We can't know for sure if the sighting is real or accurate. It could have been another day, it may have never happened, but that is considered a reliable piece of evidence in this case, so I have to factor it into this theory. Too often people pick and choose which pieces of evidence work for their theory and ignore the ones that don't fit. Now, is it possible that Rico fell into the creek following the last sighting of him? I suppose so though it seems somewhat implausible that he would return to the place where his car had been, and when he finds it gone, rather than look around for help or try and get a passers-by attention, that he'd just walk down to the creek and maybe slip and fall in. 
Unfortunately, all of these theories are tested under their scope of logic, and there's at least one theory about Rico where logic doesn't necessarily help. Rico had a drug and alcohol problem. We know from his mother that she suspected Rico had been drinking. We know from his fiance that he confessed to her that he'd fallen off the wagon. Based on the forensic search of his car, we know there was a bottle of liquor inside and an empty bottle which appeared to have contained the same liquor. Police also found the empty bindle in his car, which may have contained cocaine or meth at some point. There are the cell phone videos which exhibit erratic behavior, suggesting that Rico was in fact under the influence of something while he was in his car that night. In addition to physical evidence, we know Rico had been awake for nearly 40 hours, at least in terms of meth, a very common effect of use is not sleeping. Sleep deprivation has remarkably frightening side effects. These include impulsive behavior, irrational thoughts, paranoia, and suicidal thoughts. In addition to these side effects, sleep deprivation leads to a lack of cognitive function, making it difficult to make decisions, and also impairs physical function. Reports say that driving while sleep deprived is as dangerous as driving drunk. Additionally, Sleep deprivation has been known to lead to heart attack and stroke. Rico is in an unfamiliar area, a dangerous environment for a trained hiker, and he's suffering from sleep deprivation as a possible result of drug use. We know for a fact that he hadn't been sleeping, so we know that at a minimum he was suffering from problems with his cognitive function and a lack of physical dexterity. Just those two symptoms alone are enough to put someone in a life-or-death situation were he to wander off into the wilderness surrounding the lower parking site. Factor in the possibility of meth and alcohol, and you've got a deadly combination. Rico was likely disoriented and confused, which is how a witness described him when he saw him in the parking lot walking back and forth near his car. What I consider the most likely theory is that Rico, under the influence and lacking sleep, walked into the wilderness where he either fell and was injured, or perhaps even killed, or until he reached a point where he passed out due to lack of food and water, and either perished as a result of exposure, or woke up, realized that he didn't know where he was, and ended up wandering deeper into the wilderness rather than out of it. As previously stated, there are wild animals in the area which could have come across Rico and injured or killed him. There are steep cliffs, rocky crags, deep creeks, and predatory animals. This is not an ideal environment to be in under normal circumstances, let alone those under which Rico likely was. Detective Nyland theorized that the entire reason Rico ended up in the parking lot itself was because Rico sought out a secluded location where he might be able to drink and use without a lot of people around. Being that the lower site parking lot was so far off from his plotted course to Seattle, this is definitely a possibility. Detective Nyland goes further, saying that based on the lack of gas in Rico's car and the distance from the gas station in Lodi, he could have driven somewhere else to possibly score drugs. It's possible, but there isn't any solid evidence to support it. We also have to keep in mind Rico's sleep deprivation. There's a high likelihood that he could have simply made a wrong turn and chose to park when he realized he wasn't sure exactly where he was. Being that his cell phone reception was notoriously bad in the mountain areas, it's possible that he was lost and couldn't get a signal to GPS his way out of it. To me, it's most likely that Rico did in fact get lost in the wilderness. I don't lightly say that this is the most likely theory. Rico's previous history of drug use doesn't play a role in my thought process on this. It's purely based on what we know and the evidence at hand. Rico was once again struggling with substance abuse. Videos shot by Rico himself show him in a disoriented state of mind. Witnesses described him as seeming disoriented, and there was alcohol and possible drug paraphernalia in his car. Rico was a large man and hard to miss, but had he wandered into the countryside, he'd become much harder to spot. Rico's mother firmly believes that foul play was involved in the disappearance of her son, and although I can completely empathize with her point of view and feel for her grief, there doesn't appear to be anything that points to there being anyone else involved in this disappearance. I believe that wherever Rico ended up, he ended up there alone. It's a remarkably sad story. Rico was full of potential and was at the doorstep of starting a new life. He had a fiancé waiting for him, a new job for which he was excited, and a myriad of prospects on the horizon. It's been nearly three years since Rico vanished. There's been no activity on his bank account or on the, his missing credit card, nor in relation to his social security number. There's been no new evidence discovered sightings reported, or theories put forth. 
We can hope that someday there will be an answer as to what happened to Rico Harris. But as the years move onward, it seems unlikely that that answer will be a happy one. Rico's mother, his fiance, and his friends hold out hope that someday he will come walking back into their lives. Until some trace of Rico can be discovered, his disappearance remains a confounding, baffling end to a life of such great potential. If you're interested in finding more information about the disappearance of Rico Harris, there are many web pages and news sites that have covered it. The television show Disappeared did an episode on Rico, and you can find it in its entirety on YouTube. I'll be posting additional links with further information on the case in the Trace Evidence Facebook group. The Facebook group can be found simply by searching for Trace Evidence Podcast. If you have information regarding the disappearance of Rico Harris, please contact the Yolo County Sheriff's Department. What do you think happened to Rico Harris? I want to hear your theories and thoughts on this case. Tweet me at traceevpod, or you can email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Feel free to comment in the Facebook group. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Trace Evidence Podcast and invite you to check out our website at trace-evidence.com. You can find links to all of our social media accounts, as well as places to download and subscribe to the podcast. As always, I'm eager to hear your feedback. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a good rating on iTunes and leave us a review. This will greatly help our reach and bring more attention to the cases we cover. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us for the next episode of Trace Evidence. In the meantime, I hope to hear from you.